What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Everything is meaningless. Completely meaningless. So what's the purpose? Work, very simply, is what it claims to be. Work is work. Work is work. Did you ever ask the question, why do we have to work anyways? Why, why can't I just be on perpetual retirement and let God take care of all of my needs? Why do I have to work? That would be wonderful. Let me give you a, a couple of introductory comments before we jump into our passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. The first is this. We often view work as a part of sin's curse, but God put Adam to work before the fall. Did you know that? In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, it says this, that the Lord God placed man in the Garden of Eden to tend it and to watch over it. That's an important point because work isn't something we do just because Adam and Eve sinned and we have to go to work because Adam and Eve sinned. No, no, no. God even had Adam working in the garden before the fall. That, that leads us to the second thing. Productive work is a part of God's purpose for man. You see, God has created me and God has created you for the purpose of being productive. You weren't created to sleep in. You weren't created to eat to your, car, to your heart's content and play video games all day. You were created for a purpose. God has a plan for your life and mine, and part of that plan involves work. Here's the third statement I make as we begin. Whatever we do, we are commanded to work as if we were working for the Lord. Here's a great verse, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 7. It's in your notes. You can look at it later. I'd encourage you to underline it. The Apostle Paul says this, Work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord and not for people. Here's what he's saying. Work as if God is your boss. Why is that? Because God is your boss. And, and whatever you do, that, that, that declaration is not just made for pastors and missionaries and, and people in full-time service. Whatever you do, wherever you work, realize that you are working for the Lord. God is your boss. And the fourth thing that I would say is this. Our true identity, though, should not be found in what we do. Our true identity should be found in who we are. You see, you're not just a business owner. You're not just a teacher. You're not just an electrician. You are a child of God. And as a child of God, we should find our identity in Him even more so than in what we do. Now, guys, I get it. Uh, I mean, as guys, we're guilty of finding our identity in what we do. You get two guys together, they're sitting down. One of the very first questions we ask is, what do you do? <laughs> All right, we want to know what your job is, and I want to tell you what my job is, because if we're not careful, that's where we find our identity. But let's realize that our real identity is not found in what we do, but our real identity is found in, in who we are. We are, we are children of the King. We're a child of the living God. And that makes all of us, by the way, equal. It doesn't matter what we do or how much our paycheck is. And so here in Ecclesiastes, Solomon talks about work. And Solomon challenges us to find, challenges us to find worth in what we do, realizing that God has placed us where we are. And so we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. 
I'm going to begin in verse 18. You can follow along. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation. We'll put it up on the screen. You follow along in your translation. Notice verse 18. Many of us can probably relate to this. I came to hate all of my hard work here on the earth. Everybody, anybody ever said that? Anybody can relate to that? You wake up on Monday morning, thankfully tomorrow morning's a holiday, right? You don't have to wake up tomorrow morning to go to work. But on Monday morning, it's like, oh my word, here I go again. I've come to hate all my hard work here on the earth. Notice what he says. For I must leave to others everything I have earned. And who can tell whether my successors will be wise or foolish? Yet they will control everything I have gained by my skill and hard work under the sun. How meaningless, Solomon says. So I gave up in despair, questioning the value of all of my hard work in this world. Verse 21, some people work wisely with knowledge and skill, then must leave the fruit of their labors, their efforts, to someone who hasn't worked for it. This too is meaningless, a great tragedy, Solomon says. So what do people get in this life for all of their hard work and anxiety? Their days are filled with pain and grief. Even at night, their minds cannot rest. It's all meaningless, Solomon says. Notice verse 24, so I decided that there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. Then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. For who can eat or enjoy anything apart from him, apart from God? God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to those who please him. But if a sinner becomes wealthy, God takes the wealth away and gives it to those who please him. This too is meaningless, just like chasing the wind. Would you pray with me today? Father, I pray that you would help us to, first of all, understand what Solomon is saying in today's passage. Father, we realize that you've given us the Holy Spirit of God, who is our great teacher. And so we pray that the Holy Spirit would make these words come alive in our mind and our hearts. Help us not only to comprehend them, but Lord, help us to be willing to apply them to our hearts and lives. Father, help us to be grateful for the work that you have given to us and help us to realize that you've placed us where you've placed us. Lord, not just to earn a paycheck, but God, you've placed us there for a purpose. So God, I pray this morning that we would find worth in what you've called us to do. Help us to find value in the work that you have given to us. Lord, whether that's in the secular workforce whether that's at home taking care of children or elderly parents, Lord, whatever you've called us to do, help us to find worth in that and help us to honor you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Solomon makes just a couple of statements here and I'm gonna make it as simple as possible today. The very first statement that you'll see in your outline is this, work alone cannot provide meaning to life. I think all of us would understand that. Thomas did a great job of, of uh, illustrating what he called, he described himself as the uber businessman, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the workaholic, someone who lives for his work, whose life is completely wrapped up in what he does. And yet that individual, I know Thomas is depicting him, but that individual, whoever he or she may be, uh, would realize one day that satisfaction, joy, meaning, is not found in what you do. You certainly sense that in Solomon's testimonial that we read just a few moments ago. Now, as I read this, there are certain thoughts that came to my mind that maybe came to your mind as well. I'm not exactly sure what Solomon's work was, all right? He was, he was king, and we know that kings were royalty, and they were treated in a special way. So as I read this, I thought, what in the world does Solomon do? Does he sit around making royal decrees? Does he count all the gold coins? You know, we mentioned last week that he brought in about a billion dollars a year in gold. Did he sit around counting gold coins? Did he, did he tend to his thousand wives? <laughs> what did Solomon do? Well, seriously, he probably was the chief designer and the planner of his many building projects, what we looked at last week in the beginning of Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Whatever Solomon did, though, whatever his work was, it proved to be monotonous 
and meaningless to him. And so we read his testimonial here, and there's a couple of things that I wrote down in my notes if you'll follow along. The first is this. He talks about the reasons for our frustration with work. I thought it was interesting when I asked you just a few moments ago, how many of you like your job? Probably about 30 people raised your hand, 30 people out of uh, maybe 400 to 500 in the auditorium today. All right, work is frustrating. If I asked you today, how many of you have ever been frustrated with your work? Probably all of us would raise our hands today. Why is work so uh, frustrating? Well, obviously, there's many reasons why you may be frustrated with your work. You simply might not enjoy what you do. You might have a difficult boss, someone who's almost impossible to work for. Uh, just maybe you don't get along with your coworkers. You might say, Brian, you just wouldn't believe the people that I have to work with and the people that I have to put up with each and every day. If it wasn't for my coworkers, I would enjoy my job. Uh, maybe you have terrible hours. You might sit back and say, Brian, you wouldn't believe they work me 40, 50, 60 hours a week. Or, man, the hours I get are terrible. I work midnights instead of days. I have terrible hours. Or many of us would probably sit back and say, hey, Brian, I just don't get paid enough. I'm not being paid what I am worth. All of those things lead to frustration. Solomon's frustration was deeper, though. Solomon's not complaining about his work environment. He's not complaining about his co-workers. He's certainly not complaining about his boss, and he most certainly can't complain with the amount of money that he makes on a regular basis. His complaint is deeper. His complaint is more cosmic. Here's what Solomon says. There's two thoughts that I wrote down. You'll find them in your notes. He says this, one day everyone's work will be turned over to someone else. All of the effort that you put into your job, all of the creativity that you put into your job, all of the energy that you put into your job, whether it's your own business that you're building up or whether it's your own cubicle and you give 110% and you have made something out of your job, whatever it is, someday somebody else is going to be doing what you are doing. The ESV translates it this way. I must leave my work to the man who comes after me. You see, you better your job. As I mentioned, you grow your business. You build your brand only to leave it to someone else. Remember in the beginning of the study, we talked about the cycles of life there in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. He talked about the cycle of the sun that rises and sets. He talked about the, the cycle of the water that evaporates and then rains. And he talks about the cycle of the wind. Well, to a certain degree, he continues that idea. And he says, your work and mine is a cycle because someday we're going to cycle out of our work and someone is going to come in and take our place. One day you will pass on and someone else will have your job. Someone else will own your business. And Solomon says, man, that's frustrating. Man, that is meaningless. But there's a second thing that he alludes to in the passage. Not only will someday uh, 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 your work be turned over to someone else, but one day everyone's earnings will be turned over to someone else. Uh, that's what he makes reference to here uh, in the New Living Translation. For I must leave to others everything that I have earned. <laughs> the idea being that one day your wealth will belong to someone else. When we were, when we were in Mexico, we, uh, we frequently made reference, especially at funerals, we'd make reference to, there's a phrase that we would say, we would say, um, nunca uh, verás un camión bancario siguiendo un coche funerario. You'll never see, yeah, 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 thank you, did you want to clap for that? You didn't know I was bilingual. Uh, um, you never see a bank truck following a hearse. Why is that? You can't take it with you. It doesn't matter how much you earn. The simple truth is you can't take your wealth with you. One day it will belong to someone else. You can't take it with you. Here's a great principle that Jen alluded to, though, in our time of praise and worship. You can't take it with you, but you can pay it forward. 
That's so important. She read Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, where Jesus made the statement, Don't store up treasures on earth where moth eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store up your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The first thing that Solomon talks about is the reason for our frustration. If, if, if all we're trying to do through our work is accumulate and, and have more, that is absolutely meaningless. There's nothing to it. The reasons for our frustration. He mentions the second thing, though, in the passage, and you'll relate to this. He talks about the results of our frustration with work. I remind you in verses 22 and 23, he says this, so what do people get in this life for all of their hard work and anxiety? I, I read this, I know I made a, a reference to it last week, but I read some of these phrases and they sound just like a country western song to me. I mean, I, I mean, all of my hard work and what do you get? He says in verse 23, he says, uh, their days are filled, their days of labor are filled with pain, grief, and even they can't sleep at night. What do people get for all of their hard work? The first thing he says is work causes pain. Work causes pain. Did you ever come home from a hard day at work and your body just ached? Anybody ever feel that way? You come home from work and your body just ached? Those that have physical jobs can certainly relate to that. I remember when I was, uh, when I was about 12 or 13, my dad got a new job. When, we were, when I was young, my dad was a barber. There in Canton, Ohio, was a barber. He had his own barber shop. And then in the 1970s, long hair came in. Remember the long hair period? Long hair came in, and uh, Dad literally had to close his barber shop because he came home from work some days and said, I only cut one head of hair all day long. Nobody wanted their hair cut. It was long hair. So Dad had to go out and get another job. And so Dad went and applied at this place called Ashland Oil and started on the ground floor, and he started out working for the labor gang is what they called it. And so Dad would work in the midst of winter and he would work outside with a pickaxe and he would work outside digging ditches and digging holes. Now, thankfully, he, he advanced up in the company and did well. But in, the, but in the very beginning, man, it was physical labor. And he would come home and his body would hurt and his body would ache. That's exactly what Solomon is talking about here. He says their, their days are filled with pain because of their work. He says the second thing, work not only causes pain, but he says work causes grief. Work causes grief. You probably could more easily exchange the word grief for the word stress. All of us can relate to that. Work causes stress. Anybody stressed out because of your work? All right, all right, several of you. I, I, I meet with, with many of you on a regular basis. Man, Brian, my work is stressing me out. The American Institute of Stress reports that 83% of workers in the United States are stressed out by their jobs. 83%, by the way, that's up 10% from just last year. 25% said that they were so stressed out in their job that they wanted to scream or yell in their job. Maybe you've done that before. Maybe you got so stressed out at work that you just screamed or yelled because of the stress that you were experiencing. Why is that? Because at times we have too much to do and there's not enough time to do it. The demands are just so great. I read this week about a father that had so much work to do that he continually brought his work home. And he, he had a son that was in the first grade that wanted to play with him. But at night, the dad was having to do his work. And so one day, the, the first grader comes to dad and he asks him, Daddy, why do you always bring your work home with you? And the dad just explained, he said, because I just can't finish it during the course of the day. And the first grader thinks about it for a second and says, well, daddy, why don't they put you in a slower group? <laughs> I think all of us at times wish we were in a slower group. Don't you wish you were in a slower group? I mean, work is so fast. There's so much going on and there's not enough time to do it. It causes stress. Solomon mentions that. The third thing that he mentions is that work causes sleepless nights. Notice verse 23, even at night, their mind cannot rest. 
I'm sure all of us or many of us have experienced sleepless nights in which the problems, fears, and frustrations of our job kept us tossing and turning all night long. Maybe that happened to you last night. By the way, here's a, here's a great verse if that happens because sometimes my mind gets racing at night and it's, and it's difficult for me to, to rest and to put my head on a, on a pillow because my mind is going in so many different directions. Here's a verse if that happens that I always quote for myself, Isaiah 26 and verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace, all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. So here's just a great side note. If you're at night and you're sleepless because of the stresses and the pressures of work or maybe even the stresses and pressures of family because you're not making enough at work and you say, man, Brian, I'm having a hard time sleeping. How can I cope with that? Here's just a couple of simple recommendations. Spend time in God's word before you go to bed. Grab grab your Bible and read several of the Psalms. Spend time in God's Word. Listen to worship music. Turn the television off. Listen to worship music and allow your mind or your heart to be saturated with worship music. Get your mind focused on God. Solomon says, yeah, I understand. Work is frustrating. It causes pain. It causes grief. It causes sleepless nights. As we come to verse 23, he comes to a realization again, and he mentions the realization of our frustration with work. Notice at the end of verse 23, he says the same thing. It is all meaningless. Now, as we've walked through Ecclesiastes, you'll remember this is the fifth time that Solomon has come to this conclusion. Let me go back and remind you, if you want to look in your Bibles, in verse, chapter 1 and verse 8, he said, everything is wearisome beyond description. In chapter 1 and verse 14, he said, it is all meaningless, just like chasing the wind. In chapter 1 and verse 17, he says, but I learned firsthand that pursuing all of this is like chasing the wind. Chapter 2 and verse 11, he said, I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish. It was all so meaningless, just like chasing the wind. Verse 17, everything is meaningless, just like chasing the wind. And by the way, in verse 23, he says the same thing. It is all meaningless. Do you get the idea? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand what Solomon is saying. If you're trying to find satisfaction, if you're trying to find joy, if you're trying to find meaning by your work, you are in for a heap of disappointments. You will never find it. Work will never produce real meaning in life. Work alone cannot bring meaning to your life. Now, if we ended right there, once again, the message would be discouraged. And you might walk out of here and say, oh my word, Brian, thanks a lot. Tuesday morning, I got to get up and got to go to that job that's just like chasing the wind, that's meaningless, that provides frustration. But Solomon doesn't end there. As a matter of fact, in verses 24, 25, and 26, he completely changes the tone. In the beginning of the chapter, he says this. He says, work never provides meaning for life. Here's the second thing that he says, though, and here's what I want you to catch. Jesus alone can provide meaning to life. When you come to verse 24, you notice that there is a distinct change in tone. The negativity becomes positive. The bleakness turns to blessing. Solomon begins to find meaningless, or meaning, uh, what did I say, meaning. That which was meaningless begins to become meaningful to Solomon. Notice verse 24 again. He says, after saying it is all meaningless, in verse 24 he says, so I decided that there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in my 
work. So here, I, I want to end positive today. And I want to give you three things that Solomon mentions that's going to help you to find worth in your work. That's going to help you to realize that you are where God has placed you. And you, with Jesus, can find satisfaction in what you do. Here's the first thing he mentioned is this. Focus on the gifts from God. Instead of focusing on the negative, focus on the gifts from God. Once again, in verse 24, he says, there's nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in my work. Now, please understand, that is not a fatalistic declaration. It's not Solomon's version of, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's not what Solomon is saying. It's not a fatalistic declaration. It's a faith declaration. Here's what Solomon is saying. Everything I have comes from God. I need to realize that. Everything I have comes from God. James says it this way in James chapter 1 and verse 17. Whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. So how in the world do you find meaning in your work? How do I find meaning in my work? Just a couple of simple thoughts. The first is this. Enjoy the work that God has given to you. Enjoy the work that God has given to you. Your job was given to you by God. But Brian, I don't like it. God gave it to you. Brian, I hate it. God gave it to you. Enjoy the work that was given to you by God. Here's what Solomon is saying. Solomon is saying, it is God who wakes you up in the morning. It is God who gives you the strength, the wisdom, and the know-how to perform your work assignments. It is God who has given you your job. Enjoy the job that God has given to you. Now listen, we can be realistic today. We can complain about our work. But there are many people in our community, there are many people in our church that do not have work. And they would love to have the job that you have. Realize that God has blessed you. It might not be the perfect job. You might not make as much money as you would like. You might not get the vacation time that you would like. You might not be the supervisor. You might not be the employer. You might be the employee. But realize that your job has come from God. And God has given that to you. Enjoy the work that God has given to you. Here's the second thing that I wrote down. It's this. Enjoy the blessings that God has bestowed upon you. Enjoy the blessings. Solomon says it this way. Man, I've come to the conclusion I should enjoy eating. And I should enjoy drinking. I should enjoy what God has given to me. Hey church, sometimes we have such a heavenly mindset that we fail to enjoy the journey to heaven. Can I say that again? Sometimes we have such a heavenly mindset that we fail to enjoy the journey to heaven. Here's what Solomon is saying. Enjoy life. Enjoy what God has given to you. Enjoy God's blessings. I love Chuck Swindoll in his book on Ecclesiastes called Living on the Ragged Edge said this. We have the idea that the world is the one that gives enjoyment. And God's the one who clubs us when we want to have fun. But the fact is, it's the other way around. If you really want to have fun, I mean the kind of fun that is really enjoyment, and he puts in parentheses, without the hangover, then you need only one ingredient in your midst. You need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You need a personal relationship with the living God. According to Solomon, who can have enjoyment without him? As God's people, we're the ones who ought to be having the time of our lives. Here's what Chuck Swindoll says, but it's my observation that far too many Christians look like they've been baptized in lemon juice. Why is that? We don't seem to be enjoying life. Man, 
Life's not perfect. Life has struggles. As a pastor, I know many of the struggles that many of you are going through. We're all going through struggles. It's not easy. It's hard sometimes. I get it. But Solomon says, enjoy the life that God has given to you. What a testimony for the fact. What a testimony when we smile, even during the difficult periods of our life. And so often, Christians look like they're absolutely miserable. Man, when we're wonderful, we're on the road to heaven. We have the Holy Spirit of God who's living within us. The King of kings and the Lord of lords is our Father. We have a great future. It might be rough now, but every day it's looking better. That ought to put a smile on your face. And it ought to put a smile on mine. Solomon says, enjoy life. Here's two verses that we'll see later in our study. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 18. Even so, I have noticed one thing, at least, that it is good. It is good for people to eat and drink and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life that God has given to them. Ecclesiastes 8.15, so I recommend having fun because there's nothing better for people in this world than to eat, drink, and enjoy life. They will experience some happiness along the way with all the hard work God gives them under the sun. Hey, listen, focus on the gifts of God. It's so easy for us to have the glass half empty mentality instead of the glass half full mentality. It's easy for us to complain about what we don't have instead of rejoicing about what we do have. I sent uh, the picture that I showed you of Natalie just a few moments ago to our elders last night and one of our elders wrote back and made this statement. He says, wow. We certainly take for granted the fact that we live in the United States of America. And it's true. God has blessed us with so many things. Listen, focus on the gifts of God. When was the last time you just paused and made a list of all the things for which you are thankful? I promise you God has blessed you more than you could ever imagine and certainly more than you and I deserve. Here's the second thing. Not only focus on the, on the gifts of God, but look for the hand of God. Look for the hand of God. Notice verse 24. He says this, So I decided that there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. Then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. To appreciate life, you and I must have an understanding of the sovereignty of God. Fatalism discourages. Faith encourages. Life makes sense when you realize that God is in control. Psalm 37, 23, I quote it frequently. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. The good things and the bad things. God delights in every single detail of our lives. I think I used this illustration uh, when I first came, but, but we have on video when, when our boys were learning to ride their bikes. Parents, remember when your kids were learning to ride their bikes and you know, you'd, you'd kind of push them and they'd go a couple of feet and fall down and you'd push them again and they'd go a couple of feet and they'd fall down. Well, on this video, we watch it every now and then, we're in Mexico there and, and Justin is learning to ride his bike. Was it Justin? I think it was Justin. Justin's learning to ride his bike and you see me pushing Justin, and Justin goes maybe 15, 20 yards down, down the, the, the street, and then he falls. I mean, just has this unbelievable crash, crashes underneath our car, and you see Justin in the background, he's crying and all of that, and you see me in the foreground jumping up and down and going absolutely crazy. Justin's crying, and I'm going crazy. You might sit back and say, man, Brian, that is so sadistic. What were you jumping up and down and excited about? Because I realized he rode the bike for 20 feet. And it is only through riding for 20 feet and falling down that he what? Learns to ride the bike. You have to fall to learn to ride. 
Oh, church, that's the way God is with you and I in our lives. At times we sit back and say, God, what in the world are you doing? We're crying and God is rejoicing because God realizes that the negative things in our life, the burdens that we're bearing are working out for a positive good in our life. And we fail to see the hand of God in our midst. Listen, whatever is happening in your life, be assured of the fact that God is at work. God has not lost control. God is at work. Look for the hand of God in your life. We often fail to realize what God is doing. When you get a job, it was God that gave it to you. When you get fired, it was God that allowed it. When you struggle with an illness, it is God who is permitting it. When you get a huge check back from the IRS, it comes from God. God is in charge of all of those things. Whatever your blessing, whatever your struggle, learn to see the hand of God in your life. That's what Solomon said. Man, he said, I've come to enjoy life, and I've come to see that all of these pleasures are from the hand of God. Here's a third thing, and this is so convicting for me. The third thing is this strive to please God. Focus on the gifts of God. Look for the hand of God, but strive to please God. Notice what Solomon says in verse 26. Two times in verse 26, he mentions pleasing God. Verse 26, God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to those who, what does he say? Those who please him. But if a sinner becomes wealthy, God takes the wealth away and gives it to those who please him. Now, please, I wish I could say that always happens. Please, God, you know, the wealthy person's money is going to come your way. That doesn't always happen. But here's what Solomon is saying. Strive to please God in everything you do. Those of us that understand from a New Testament perspective realize that it's all about pleasing Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10 31, Paul says this, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 5 9, so whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him. So as believers, our responsibility is to please him in everything we do. I read a great quote from Martin Luther that I forgot to put in my notes this week. And Martin Luther makes this statement. He says, whatever you do, do it to the best of your ability. And he, and he goes through and he talks about, he said that when a maid sweeps floors, God takes pleasure in that. Why? Because God likes clean floors. Martin Luther said, and so if you make shoes... Make those shoes in such a way that God is pleased, not by putting a cross on every single shoe, but making sure that you do them well, because why? God loves things that are done well and that are done right, and they're done for His honor and His glory. And so realize, whatever you've been called to do, do it in a way that pleases God. Church, this is so practical for us because at times we feel like that the only people that are really involved in ministry are the pastoral staff. There's Brian and Jose and Brad and Thomas, and those are the people that are involved in the work of God. That couldn't be farther from the truth. All of us are involved in the work of God. And God has divinely and sovereignly and supernaturally placed you exactly where he wants you to be so that you can be a missionary in the place of work where God has placed you. Let me give you three final conclusions today. Number one, God has placed you in your job to please him. Uh, Man, this, this probably doesn't need to be said, but maybe we need to say, you ought to be the very best worker at your job in that workforce. There should be nobody at your job that works any better than you. Why? Because you're a child of the living God. And you're working for God. You're not working for your boss. Realize you've been placed in your job to please God. God has placed you in your job to provide for your family. That's a no-brainer. And God has placed you in your job to be a witness for others. 
Listen, you are where you are for a purpose. So that you can be light in the midst of darkness. So that you can be a believer in the midst of unbelievers. So you can be a Christian in the midst of those who are not Christians. So that you can shine the glorious light of the gospel. Solomon says this, man, I get it. Work is frustrating. Work is meaningless, just like chasing the wind. If I only have an under the sun perspective. But when all of a sudden I change my perspective and I realize I do what I do, not just to get a paycheck, not just to find satisfaction in myself. I do what I do to please the living God. And I do what I do to point others to Jesus, all of a sudden we find worth in what 